We welcome you this week. I trust that uh, you've had a great and a wonderful week. Um, well, I do want to publicly apologize for the confusion concerning uh, Bible study. And so anyways, uh, we will be at least online. Uh, we will see how the weather goes and uh, possibly get back to normal in-house. So uh, the plan is this week, we're gonna do it in-house and we're gonna do it on Zoom online as well. So that's, that's the plan, okay? Uh, we'll see what happens. I want to uh, uh, continue the series that we're on this morning. And as we're working through God's providence, can we have a slide, please? And when you think about the providence of God, right, I hope that you're beginning to realize that God is not only sovereign, that he's in control. He rules over all things. But God's special care, his guidance and direction in our lives is all for him to accomplish his plans and his purposes as well. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's hard to understand. So allow me this morning to take a look at how God's special care, his guidance, his direction is going to happen so that his will is done in our lives. So let me ask you a question this morning. What is your purpose in life? I don't know if ever you've wrestled with that question, but what is my purpose in life? Why am I here? Uh, why was I created? Why was I made? And especially sometimes uh, we just wonder and, and the answer comes back blank. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what my purpose in life is. There's a book out, it's called it, uh, The Purpose Driven uh, Christian. And uh, it's a good book to read that goes with that whole theme about our purpose in life. But what is our purpose in life? Suppose, for example, that in the next 30 years, okay, assuming that you're young and uh, uh, you're looking for dreams and but suppose that in the next 30 years, you would have a great life. I mean, life is amazing. It's, uh, nothing is going wrong. Everything is going right. And life is, is as they say, life is good. Uh, and you had a good job, and you enjoyed your job, and you had money, uh, to, and you had no debts, and uh, uh, all the credit card bills are paid, and uh, uh, life is good, and, and you're married, and you get children and grandchildren, and life is absolutely just wonderful. You are living the dream. Go back to when you were younger and ask yourself what your dream was in life. And as you come back and you look at it from an elderly an elderly perspective, an older perspective, not that we're old, okay? but sometimes those dreams don't come about. And we have dreams and they don't always happen. Okay? But would you want that kind of a life, to have a great life and maybe enjoying life and life is fantastic. And, and the interesting thing is that there are so many people today who, who don't, uh, they're not enjoying life. Life is miserable. And uh, the, the advertisement I saw this week was by Dr. Ben Carson, who's a, a wonderful, well-respected man. And I think certainly this is Black History Month. And, and if I have any favorite uh, people in the, in the uh, black uh, community, it would be Dr. Carson. But you know what Dr. Carson said this a couple weeks ago? He's advising people, stop listening to the media. Because the media is going to poison your mind. It's part of the, the world's system that is under the control of evil. And when you're listening to that, you're listening to lies. And what his advice was, and I respect this man. Brother Joe and I went to hear Brother Carson a few uh, years ago, and uh, when he was uh, 
considering candidating to become the president. He's a wonderful man, a brilliant neurosurgeon, and, he's a, and uh, his life is just amazing. But his advice to us is stop listening to the news because the news really poisons you and the news drives fear. And so many people are listening to the news but they're not enjoying life at all. Life is miserable. For our seniors, which is supposed to be the, the golden years of happiness and retirement and, and enjoying life, it's anything but that. But suppose that you could have that kind of a life, an amazing, wonderful life, that you're living the dream. Don't you desire that? Don't we all want that, a good life? But suppose that in the next 30 years, to get to that great life, you had to endure hardships, troubles, struggles, and you were hated along the way, or rejected, or betrayed. And suppose you had to go through that, Would you do it? Would you go through this kind of a life for the next 30 years to be able to get that kind of a life? And most people say no. They don't want that. They don't want the hardships. They don't want the struggles. They don't want to be rejected. They really don't want to be betrayed or hated. They just want to be accepted and have a great life. But I believe that everything happens for a reason in life. There's a purpose behind everything that happens. And this morning I want to deal with a particular story that will show the hardships, the struggles, the betrayal, the hatred. And it's wrapped up in the subject of God's providence that we talk about cooperation, what God is doing, what we're doing, and how things seem to be fitting in together, and sometimes when they don't seem to make sense at all. And so this morning, I just want to... Uh, help you to understand that God desires to work his will for his good pleasure in us. He really does that. He really desires that. God wants to, through his, his workings, he wants to work in you so that we do what he wants us to do and we do it for his glory. We do it willingly and we do it joyfully. Listen to what the scripture says. Philippians chapter 2, continue to work out your salvation with fear and troubling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Father, we pray this morning that you would help us to understand, oh Lord, life is complicated. Life is difficult. And sometimes it discourages us. And sometimes, oh Lord God, we, we stop understanding what you're doing and we look at our situation and our problems and difficulties and we say, Father in heaven, it makes no sense at all. But we need to trust you this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit would help us, O Lord God, to understand how you work in our lives for our good, for your good pleasure. You work in us to will so that your plans and your purposes are accomplished in our lives, and we would do it willingly and joyfully as well. We ask this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in the world of math, they talk about uh, lines or curves that meet at a certain point. 
It's called uh, concurrency. Providence is very much like that. Your life, you have a beginning point. You have an ending point. And when it intersects with the lives of, of other people, it's called concurrent. So, for example, all the events in your life, when they happen, okay? This event is happening at one moment, and this other event is happening at the same time. That's called concurrency. They're happening at the same time. For example, somebody says, hey, are you going to the Berlin Fair? And you say, well, no, I can't, because I'm going to the... Uh, um, uh, to the fair in uh, Freiburg, Maine. <laughs> well, two events are happening at the same time. But in the providence of God, we understand that, that God uses our lives and he uses events so that there are times that they happen and that's a God moment. That's a moment that we have to understand that, and it's usually that we don't understand that it's a God moment. But it usually is. I want to show you that this morning. So take a look at your life for a moment. You're born, but you came from parents and from grandparents. And their parts of their life intersect with your life. And they become real to you, whether good or bad. Okay? They're a part of your life, and that's part of interactions in your life. You go to school. You interact with other kids. You go on to college. You meet friends. and uh, Or in time, you get married to somebody. And uh, your lives intersect with that person. Uh, you have children and grandchildren. You go to work. And you meet other people. And your life is constantly intersecting with other people. And there's a reason for that. And until you retire or until you die, God says that he has ordained those lives, those events, for a reason and a purpose. So when we think of God's providence, we think of not only all the events happening and intersecting, and it's a God moment, but we also understand that God rules and controls all things, everything, for his plans and his purposes. Sometimes that is hard for us to understand. But listen to what the scripture says. In him, in Ephesians 1, verse 11, we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him. Notice that. According to God's plan. And look what God does. He works out everything. Not a few things. Not some things. Otherwise, he would not be God. He is God and he works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God is God and he's not only sovereign and rules and controls everything to come to pass, but behind that, God has a purpose. And we know that the scripture says that everything works out for good. To those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So the providence of God really says there's a reason and a purpose for everything in life. The good, the bad, the ugly. Even when we don't understand it. But when you try to understand it in light of God's hand of providence... As you get older, it's like the pieces of a puzzle. The pieces begin to fit in. And you begin to see a beautiful picture. You see, God made you, and he made you special, and he made you for a reason. He made you for with his plans in mind. And our job and our responsibility, knowing that we've been created special with a unique plan and a purpose for our lives, we are to live our lives to honor him and to glorify him. And I want to try to illustrate all of that. This is just my introduction. To say that God is in every detail of life. And if you start to look at it from God's perspective, 
it begins to make sense. The greatest story in the scripture, in my opinion, is the story of Joseph. And you can read that. Genesis 37 to 50. Probably take you about an hour to read it. Every year, and I read this story every year, as I try to go through the scriptures once a year, uh, the whole Genesis to Revelation. And every time I come and I read this story, I am moved. I am in my chair and I am weeping, bawling like a little baby. There's just something so powerful about this because you begin to see the hand of God in the life of Joseph. And not only in the life of Joseph, but remember I said how it's related to our parents and grandparents. And Joseph is the son of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of, of Abraham. And God had made a promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that I'm going to do something special in your days. Now, Joseph, his life, his story, comes to bear in mind. We know he has 11 brothers. Ten of them hate him. They hate him because Joseph was also working in the father's uh, uh, sheepfold, taking care of the sheep. And one day the father said, go check up on your brothers. He does, and guess what? He saw the brothers uh, mistreating the animals and, and not caring for them. He comes back and he gives a bad report. Well, if somebody gave a bad report about them, you're not going to be all lovey-dovey about them, are you? The Bible says they began to hate Joseph. They hated Joseph for other reasons. Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob. And I think he favored Joseph over the all 11, probably because of his wife, Rachel. Rachel had died giving birth to Benjamin. And if you know the story of Jacob, Jacob was madly in love with, with uh, Rachel and was forced to marry Leah first. And then he ended up working 20 years of his life in hard labor for Rachel's brother Laban. But Jacob, when he lost Rachel, he set his affection and his love upon Joseph. And he bought him a special coat. It's what we call the coat of many colors. <clears throat> Look at that. Father didn't buy me a coat. <laughs> How come he bought Joseph a coat? He loves Joseph more than me, more than us. And the Bible says they began to hate Joseph even more. The third reason I think that they hated him was probably because Joseph began to have dreams. And Joseph had a dream that, that this sheaf, his sheaf, stood way up, and 11 sheaves were bowing down in his presence. He told the dream to his brothers. And they said, what, shall we bow before you? And they hated him all the more. And Joseph had another dream that the sun and the moon and the stars were bowing down to him. And the Bible says they hated him with a passion. So there was evil in their heart. One day, Jacob says to Joseph, go check on your brothers. He goes to check upon them. And they see him coming with his beautiful, bright coat. And what do they say? Here comes that dreamer. Let's put him in a pit. Let's kill him. Let's kill Joseph. We'll see what happens with his dreams. So they take him. They strip him of his coat. They put him in a, in a uh, cistern waiting to kill him. In God's timings and the events of the world, there's a caravan that just happened to be going by. They're cousins of the family. What do they do? They sell Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. And they have two shekels apiece. Not a whole lot of money. But it, the Judas says, let's sell him instead of killing him, have his blood upon us. So they sold him. 
They brought them all the way down to Egypt, and they sold them to Potiphar. Potiphar was a very wealthy uh, Egyptian, and uh, we're told that Joseph went to live there. But we're also told in the scripture, and the Lord was with Joseph. And everything he did, he was successful. It's like Joseph believed in the Lord. Somehow Jacob had done a good job to teach him about the Lord, to raise him up in the ways of the Lord. And Joseph loved God with all of his heart and believed in him. And he believed that everything he did was to serve God. That was his motive. That was his purpose, was to serve God. But here he is. He's hated. He's despised. He's rejected. He is sold. He comes into an area, doesn't even speak the language, doesn't understand the culture, and he becomes a servant. Isn't it amazing that through all this, he doesn't become angry, bitter, resentful, that's how most people interpret the, the, the bad stuff of life. Or they blame other people rather than think that maybe God is behind this. And so he begins to serve. Everything that Joseph does is amazing. It's wonderful. Potiphar recognizes that. And what does he do? He puts him in charge of his whole household. And he begins to tell the slaves what to do, the servants what to do, and he is in charge. And Potiphar said, you are second to me in my house. And he begins to do everything he can with all of his heart for the Lord. Well, in time, Potiphar's wife begins to notice him. We're told that Joseph is 17 years old. He's a handsome man. Uh, hormones are probably raging, and he's flexing his six-pack and look at me. And, but Potiphar's wife begins to notice him. And she comes up to him and she says, lie in bed with me. Come to bed with me. And he said, no. And she kept doing it day in, day out. And finally one day he says, how can I do this wicked thing and sin against God? See, it's like what kept the driving Joseph was not the circumstances, the good, the bad, the ugly, but it was the fact that he was living his life to serve God, and if he had an affair with a woman that was not his wife, it was adultery, and it was wrong, and it was sinful, and it was wicked, and he didn't want to sin against God. What a great motivation for life. And we do everything to do what is right and pleasing to the Lord. He did not want to sin against God. But one day she sends all the servants out. And he's alone with her. And she takes a hold of him. She grabs him. And he says, I cannot do this. And he leaves. He escaped. But he leaves his coat behind. She begins screaming. Joseph made sport of me. Joseph attacked me. The servants go and tell Potiphar. Potiphar comes in and he hears these words. Joseph made sport of me. And his, his anger flares up rather than trying to get the facts. Trying to talk to Joseph. He believes his wife and he has Joseph thrown in prison. For the next 12 to 13 years of his life, Joseph is in prison. Imagine that at 17, carried away from your family. There's one scripture that tells us that, that when they sold him, he was crying. He was screaming, don't sell me as a slave. I mean, imagine the emotion of being betrayed, rejected, hated, sold into slavery, lied about, falsely accused. And you end up in jail. And we're told that the passage is very clear. It's, and the Lord was with Joseph. And everything he did, he was successful. He lived his life to please God, to serve God. The warden began to notice this. That there was something special about Joseph. 
And guess what he did? He put him in charge of the prison system. It was the king's prison. He was not only in charge of Pharaoh's house, but now he's in charge of the prison system and everything he does. God blesses. One day, there were two men, and they had a dream. They tell their dream to Joseph, and he said, dreams belong to God. One of them is the baker. One of them is the butler or the cupbearer. Joseph tells them, this is what's going to happen. The baker is going to be beheaded in three days. But whatever he did, we don't know. But he tells the cupbearer, the butler, he says, you're going to be restored to your position. And when you are restored to your position, remember me with your favor. Tell Pharaoh. And he made a promise. And he said, I will. The cupbearer is released two years later. Two more hard years of prison time. You wonder, has God abandoned me? Is there any hope in life? Well, I died in this prison. After all, I didn't even do anything wrong. But God's activities and events and how everything intersects. In the meantime, what happens is that God begins to give a dream to Pharaoh. Pharaoh has this dream and, and he tells his wise men, they can't tell him the meaning of it. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer speaks up. He says, oh, king, live forever. He says, I remember my fault. Two years ago, I was in prison, and this Hebrew man told me my dreams, and it came to pass, and I was restored. And he told the baker's dreams, and it interpreted that, and it came to pass. And he was beheaded. Pharaoh sends for Joseph. They uh, tell him to take a bath and wash and shave, and he give him a good set of clean clothes. Joseph comes in the presence and Pharaoh is excited because he knows this man can tell him his dream and interpret it. But Joseph says, I cannot do it. God is the one who's going to reveal to you what the dreams are. And so, make a long story short, Joseph begins to tell him that there's going to be seven years the seven cows and the seven uh, stalks of corn that are big, fat, and, and, and uh, abundant. He said, that's going to be seven years of abundance is going to come upon this land. And then the, 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 the gaunt, lean, thin cows that ate the big, fat cows and nothing changed to them. And the, the corn stalks that ate the fat ones. He said, that is seven years of famine. The famine is going to be so great that nobody will even remember the seven years of abundance and prosperity. And Joseph tells him what to do. He ought to set up some, some storehouses and collect a fifth of all the, all the, the uh, uh, agriculture and, and the crops and store them. And for seven years, that's exactly what they did. You see, Joseph began to serve Pharaoh at the age of 30. But 30 years of his life were hard, difficult, troubled lives. He was lied about, betrayed. He was hated, rejected, sold as a slave. And yet, he is exalted. He's not only in charge of Pharaoh's house, not only in charge of the prison system, but now he is in charge of Egypt. And Egypt is the richest land in the world. Egypt is the greatest power that is upon the earth. It would be like ruling over America. And so that's exactly what happens as people parade about and, and walk about and they see Joseph, they bow down to him because he is second in command to Pharaoh. 30 long years of hardships. <clears throat> He's given a wife. Uh, he has two beautiful sons. And he's really enjoying life. And now for seven years, years of abundance, and, and the crops are blessed, and they soar it, and, and Joseph is constantly devising new plans so that in the end, at the end of the, the when the famine begins, 
people come to buy uh, crops. Joseph is the most powerful man in the world. Well, look what he had to go through it. Look what he had to do. Look what he had to endure. See, we don't want the hard times. But the hard times are ordained of God for us to realize that God is part of our lives. God is directing everything, everything according to his plans and purposes. So what does he do? He begins selling the crops. One day, these ten Hebrew men come, Jacob and set them down. And we are told that when the brothers that Joseph recognized, but they did not recognize him, when they saw Joseph and didn't know it was him, what did they do? They bowed down before him. Remember the dreams. And Joseph says, who are you? So we are from the land of Canaan, uh, and we've come to buy uh, crops. And Joseph was really um, rude with them. And he said, you are spies. The only reason you came down here was to spy the abundance that we have. No, no, no. We're, we're, we're uh, ten sons. We were twelve. One is gone. We have one that is younger, our youngest son. Our father is old. Our father said, we're not spies. So Joseph comes up with a plan. He said, okay. He said, I will keep one of you here in prison. You go back, get your brother, and I will see if you're lying to me. See if you're spies. And the brother says, we can't do that because our father will die if we, he will not be separated from the youngest. You are spies. And they leave. Inside their sacks, full of grain. Even the money that they had paid was inside the bag of every single brother. They come home and they tell the father, Father, uh, uh, the ruler of Egypt is rude and, and he was harsh with us. And he says that if we want more grain, we have to bring Benjamin down with us. And all of a sudden, it's like Jacob lost it. I lost Joseph. Simeon is no longer with me, and now you, you want Benjamin to bring him down here? No. And to make a long story short, until the supplies were gone, they come to him and they say, Father, we need more supplies. We've got to go back down to Egypt. We've got to go get some more food. Go. He says, but remember, the ruler says that we cannot go back unless our younger brother and as much as Jacob fought it and said no, he knew for the survival of their family, they had to get food. Benjamin goes down with them. And when Joseph hears that Benjamin is with them, he tells his story, he says, bring him to my home. They come to the home, and all of a sudden, when they see Joseph, guess what they do? They fall down and bow down before him a second time. They talk about it, and uh, Joseph finds out how his father is, and, and so he, make a long story short, he, he sends them off with food. And what he does, he comes up with a brilliant, brilliant roots story. He says, fill the bags with grain, put all their money in there, and he said, take my special silver cup. And put it in the youngest one's bag, in Benjamin's bag. They leave. They're on their way. They're excited. They got food. Benjamin is with them. Dad is going to be happy with us. All of a sudden, the steward shows up in a, in a, a, a hurried flight. He stops them. And he says, one of you is guilty of stealing my master's silver cup. No, 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 we're not thieves. Uh, we're honest people. We're going back to our father. He says, let me check. They start with the oldest, and they go all the way down. When they get down to Benjamin's sack, they not only find the money, but they find the cup as well. The steward brings them back, okay, all the way back to Joseph's house. And he says, and Joseph meets them, and he's even tougher with them. And he says, I will keep this one over here, 
The rest of you can go home. And Judah pleads with him. He said, please, please. He said, if we go back and Benjamin is not with us, it will bring our father down to the grave. By this time, Jacob was 130 years old. And Joseph can't take it anymore. He really can't. He knows who they are. They don't know who he is. And all of a sudden, Joseph commands the people, he, all the Egyptians, to get out. And he reveals himself and he says, I am Joseph. 22 years later, they see his brother and they're in shock. Joseph loses it and he just starts weeping and crying and he was crying and weeping so loud that even the Egyptian servant heard Joseph weeping. It's just one of those great happy moments of reunion and, and emotion and, and everybody's hugging and kissing each other and they're glad. And then when Joseph gets to Benjamin, he takes a hold and just weeps and weeps and weeps. They still can't believe him. He said, I am Joseph. You intended this for harm, to get rid of me. You intended this for evil. You sent me here. But now go back. Go back and bring my father back, and we will give him the best of the land. And so what happens? Joseph sends his brothers. They come back, and they tell Jacob, Joseph is alive, and he doesn't believe it. And when he sees all the supplies and everything, finally they hear Joseph is alive. And he says, I must go down to visit him. Jacob comes down, visit him. And it's just a powerful moment of a father and a son in that reunion, in that reconciliation of just loving one another. They haven't seen one another for years. And they just cry and hug and weep. It's a dramatic moment. Uh, it's a powerful moment. And he says, Father, he says, you must come and meet Pharaoh. And when Joseph brings Jacob to Pharaoh, what does Jacob do? He blesses Pharaoh. You see, God had commanded Abraham and Isaac and Jacob uh, uh, to be the blessings of the earth. And now they're in the presence of God. And, and, and Jacob knows he's in the presence of God. While he's in the presence of Pharaoh. And he blesses him. And all the land of Ramesses. The land of Goshen. The richest, most fertile. While the world is, is drying up. In drought and famine. Goshen is prospering. That particular piece of the land is given to Jacob and his sons to fulfill that God had said to Jacob years and years before, I will watch over you, I will guard you, I will take care of you, I will direct you, I will bless you. And we're told that Joseph provided for his family all the days of their lives. Jacob finally dies at the age of 147. He spent the next 17 years of his life. Isn't that amazing? Think it through. Joseph was 17 years when he was abducted, carried off. And God blesses Jacob and gives him 17 years. It's like the missing years with Joseph, he gives him back. And now Jacob dies at the age of 147 years old. And they bury him. The brothers were connivers. Connivers. They were wicked. They were evil. And they said, well, our father is dead. Perhaps Joseph is going to uh, betray us and, and, and hurt us and, and be unkind to us. So they go to him and they say, our father said, would you please forgive us? This is what Joseph says. It is one of the most powerful moments in the life of the story of Joseph. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for I am, am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, 
to bring about what many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them. And he spoke kindly to them. Notice that Joseph is not angry and not bitter, resentful. But rather, he pours out the abundant, lavish kindness and the grace and the mercy and the love to his brother. They don't deserve it. But Joseph takes care of them and their families for the rest of their lives. What a beautiful picture it is of Almighty God. God who loves us and, and says, I will put my special care and, 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 and I will watch over you and I will lead you and I will guide you and, I, and everything that will happen will be for a reason and a plan and a purpose. And I will be good to you. What ultimately does God do? He sends his son, Jesus, to die on the cross so we can be forgiven. It is one of the most beautiful stories that helps us to remind us that God made us. Made us for a purpose in life. That you have a purpose, a God-ordained purpose in life. And your job is to find it. Ultimately, it's to glorify God and serve Him and live for Him. Are you doing that? Are you doing that to live for God? And every breathing moment, every life that interacts with you, every event that happens, do you see it as the hand of God that God is ordaining good for your life to lead you, to guide you, to care for you, to give you a special care for you? That's God's providence. We're starting to wrap up the series on the providence of God. But every detail of life is part of God's plans. There's a reason and a purpose for everything. So the question is, as we conclude, how do we find that? Well, number one, it begins by faith and trust. Joseph trusted the Lord that every detail, everything that was happening, it was for good. Even though others meant it. For evil. So by faith and trust, and it begins with a relationship, you can never find the will of God apart from, from understanding what Jesus did for you. That he went to the cross, and he died, and he was buried, and he rose again, and all of your sins are forgiven, and he wants to give you the Spirit of God, so the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, and the Spirit of God is leading you and guiding you, and it's the Spirit of God, and sometimes he leads us in difficult times and hard times, but to strengthen us, to make us strong, so that every activity in our lives is part of the hand of God. I want you to go back this week and look at your lives. Look back at when you were young and especially the bad things that happened. There was a reason for that. Look at the good. It's easy to understand. But the good was all part of God's graciousness and gifts to you. And it was all part of God's plans to bring you here and now. What a good God we have who loves you with an everlasting love and he cares for you and he will guide you and he will direct you. That's his providence. It's his invisible hand. And it's amazing that when we think we've been talking only the hand of God in the last several weeks, but behind the hand of God is the person and the presence of Almighty God. That God walks with us. He will never leave us. He will never abandon us. And if something bad happens, there's a reason and a purpose and a plan behind it. Our job is to acknowledge him. And as Proverbs 3, 5 says, acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. So you trust him. You invite him to come to live in your life. The Spirit of God comes. And you begin talking to him. It's called prayer. You begin getting in the word. How many Christians are struggling and wondering, what is my purpose in life? And they're never in the word of God. 
And you can't separate the will of God from the Word of God, and you need to get into the Word of God to understand the mind of God. When you understand the mind of God, you're going to begin to understand the, 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 the Spirit of God and the plans of God for your lives. Get in the Word. Have a plan to just read it every day. No, I'm just too busy. And it leaves you dry, worn out, and you're still struggling. What's my purpose in life? Get into the scriptures. You know, just a, a one verse of scripture a day is not going to cut it. You need to spend time, read the word, and read as much as you can, and come into the presence of God and say, Spirit of God, speak to me today. I need to hear from you. And God will. God will use his word to speak his truth into your heart so that you will begin to understand what the plans and purposes of God are. You see, that's God's providence. It's his special care. It's his guidance. It's his direction for our lives. Psalm 139 says that God has planned the beginning as well as the end. And everything in between is all ordained and planned of God for good. Even when we see it as something bad. The next time that you see that it seems to be working out for bad, say, you know what, maybe the devil meant it for evil. Maybe other people meant it for evil. But God, you, I'm interpreting this. I'm looking at life through the perspective. God, you intend good for me. Because you're going to take care of me. You're going to walk with me. And you're going to be by my side. And as the scripture says, and the Lord was with Joseph. And God gave him success. 30 years from now, who knows where we're going to be. But we can have the life at the end in our timing, in God's timing, that we can be part of the plans of God, the purposes of God, knowing that they're all good. It's going to be a beautiful life. Even with this virus situation, even when pe people are panicking all over the world, would you do what Ben Carson says? Turn off the radio, turn off the TVs, and stop listening. And start listening to your Father in heaven. Because Jesus was kind to his own. But look what Joseph did. I think Joseph is a type of Christ. We won't get into that, okay? But what does Joseph say? He says, I'm going to be kind. <laughs> I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your families, your little ones. I give you plenty of bread, plenty of food. And that's what God says, I want to do today. I want to do that. Just trust me. Walk with me. Spend time with me. Love me. Fellowship with me. And watch what God is going to do. While the singers are coming for the closing hymn, I want to close in prayer. Father in heaven, this morning, we just want to say thank you. And Father, if anybody is online and maybe they're wondering, what's my purpose in life? I pray that your Holy Spirit would help them to see that, Lord, your purpose for them is to draw them in a relationship with Jesus Christ and to be filled with the Spirit of God and to be led by God and to live by the Spirit of God. Would you draw them, whoever they are? And Father, maybe we're here and we would call ourselves Christians. But we're not sure. We're not sure what you're doing. We don't know what our purpose is. Would you make that known to us this morning? Would you get us back to the fountain, back to the Word, back to prayer, back to spending time and to walking with you, to learn from you, to seek you, and as the scripture says, to seek you with all of our hearts, and we shall find you. Father, bless and honor your word today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Page 461, 461, he leadeth me. Let's rise as we sing this.
asking him, telling him, are you going to live by faith? We're going to trust you. If God would watch over you and guard you and keep you in his special hand of providence, make that commitment today. Father, we pray, O oh Lord God, that as we hear this wonderful, amazing story, I pray, Lord, you bless it to our hearts, and we pray that your spirit would move us, O oh Lord God, to understand even some of the truths that I have not been able to share because of time. But I pray that by your power, by your spirit, by your might, by your hand, O oh Lord God, that you help us to see that your hand is upon us. You will lead us. You will guide us. You will direct us. You will care for us, O oh Lord, because you're an amazing God. You are loving and kind and merciful and gracious. And like the ten other brothers, Lord, we don't deserve your goodness and your mercies, but we receive them by faith in Jesus Christ. Spirit of God, bless your people this day. Lord, remove the fears, the doubts, the worries. Oh, Lord God, help us to tune out the world, but to listen to the voice of the Spirit of God in your word. Bless your people this day. Thank you for this time, for this week, Lord, and help us to see your hand of providence in our lives this week. And we'll praise you, we honor you, and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a great and a wonderful week. If you're online this morning and maybe have questions, please send us your questions. I will respond to those this way. God bless.